Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to start talking about ideas that are called self-supervised learning. So somehow we want to obtain labels by self-supervision and we will look into what this term actually means, what the core ideas are in the next couple of videos. So this is part three of weekly and self-supervised learning. And today we actually start talking about self-supervised learning. There are a couple of ideas around in self-supervised learning and you can essentially split them into two parts. You can say one is how to get the labels, the self-supervised labels. And the other part is that you work on the losses in order to embed those labels and have particular losses that are suited for the self-supervision. Okay, so let's start with the definition. And the motivation is, you could say that classically, people in machine learning believe that supervision is, of course, the approach that produces the best results. But we have these massive amounts of labels that we need. So you could actually very quickly then come to the conclusion that the AI revolution will not be supervised. This is very clearly visible in the following statement by Jan Le Kuhn. Most of human and animal learning is unsupervised learning. If intelligence was a cake, unsupervised learning would be the cake. Supervised learning would be the icing on the cake. And reinforcement learning would be the cherry on the cake. And of course, this is substantiated by observations in biology and how humans and animals learn. So the idea of self-supervision is that you try to use information that you already have about your problem to come up with some surrogate label that allows you to do training processes. The key ideas here on this slide by Jan Le Kuhn can be summarized as the following. So you try to predict the future from the past. You can predict the future also from the recent past, or you predict the past from the present or the top from the bottom. Also an option could be to predict the occluded from the visible. So you pretend that there is a part of the input that you don't know and predict that. And this essentially allows you to come up with a surrogate task and with the surrogate task, you can already perform training. And the nice thing is you don't need any label at all because you intrinsically use the structure of the data. So, Essentially, self-supervised learning is an unsupervised learning approach. But every now and then you need to make clear that you're doing something new in a domain that has been researched on for many decades. So you may not refer to the term unsupervised anymore. And Jan Le Kuhn actually proposed the term self-supervised learning. And he realized that unsupervised is a loaded and confusing term. So although the ideas have already been around before the term self-supervised learning has been established, it makes sense to use this term to concentrate on a particular kind of unsupervised learning. So you could say it's a subcategory of unsupervised learning. It uses pretext, surrogate or pseudo tasks in a supervised fashion. And this essentially means you can use all of the supervised learning methods and you have labels that are automatically generated that can then be used as a measurement of correctness to create a loss in order to train your weights. And the idea is then that this is beneficial for a downstream task like retrieval, supervised or semi-supervised classification and so on. By the way, in this kind of broad definition, you could also argue that generative models like generative adversarial networks are also some kind of semi-supervised learning method. So essentially, Jan de Kuhn had this very nice idea to frame this kind of learning in 
a new way. And if you do so, this is of course very helpful because you can make clear that you're doing something new and you're different from the many unsupervised learning approaches that have been out there for a very long time. Okay, so let's look into some of these ideas. There's of course these pretext tasks and you can work with generation-based methods. So you can use GANs, you can do like super resolution approaches, you downsample and try to predict the higher resolution image. You can do inpainting approaches or colorization. Of course, this also works with videos. You can work with context-based methods. So here you try to solve things like the jigsaw puzzle or clustering. In semantic label-based methods, you can do things like trying to estimate moving objects or predict the relative depth. Then there's also cross-modal based methods where you try to use from one modality, so you have a linked sensor system, let's say you have a depth camera and an RGB camera, then you can link the two and try to predict the one from the other. Or if you have an attached sensor, let's say you have a car and you're moving, you have a GPS sensor or any other sensory system that will tell you how your car is moving, then you can try to predict the ego motion from the actual video sequence. So let's look into this in a bit of more detail and look at image-based self-supervised learning techniques to refine representation learning. The first idea are the generative ones. So you can, for example, do image colorization. That's very easy to generate labels. So you start with color images, compute essentially the average over the channels that gives you a gray value image, and then you try to predict the original color again. So you can use a kind of CNN encoder decoder approach in order to predict the correct color maps. Furthermore, you can also go into inpainting, so you can occlude parts of the image and then try to predict those. And this then essentially results in the following task that you try to predict an image completion method where you then compare to the actual full image to the actual prediction that was created by your generator and you can train these things, for example, in a gun type of loss setting, where you have a discriminator that then tells you whether this was a good inpainting result or not. There's also ideas about spatial context. So here, a very common approach is to solve a jigsaw puzzle. So you take a patch, or actually you take nine patches of the image, and you essentially try to predict if you have the center patch let's say the face of the cat here, and you have one ear, you want to predict what is the ID of the patch that is shown. So you put in the two images and try to predict the correct location of the second patch. Note that this is a bit tricky because there is a trivial solution possible. And this happens if you have boundary patterns that are continuing. So if you have continuing textures, then it may occur that the actual patch can very easily be detected in the next patch because the texture is continued. So you should use large enough gaps in order to get around of this problem. Also color may be tricky, so you can use chromatic aberration and pre-process the images by shifting green and magenta toward gray, or you randomly drop two of the color channels in order to avoid that you're only learning about color. There's an improved version of the jigsaw puzzle, jigsaw puzzle plus plus. And here the idea is that you essentially randomize the order of the patches and you try to predict the correct 
location of each patch. Now the cool thing about this is if you have nine tiles then you have nine factorial possible permutations and this is more than 300,000 so you can create plenty of labels for these tasks and you see that it's actually key that you do it in the right way so it's not just that you have a lot of permutations but you also want to make sure that there is an appropriate average hamming distance and you can see if you actually obey these two ideas then this makes a difference so if you have a too low average hamming distance the jigsaw task accuracy is not very high and if you get an increase in the jigsaw task accuracy there's a very high likelihood that this high accuracy then will also go to the actual task of interest so here it is detection and with a high jigsaw task accuracy you also build a better detector well which other ideas could we be interested in of course you can do similar things with rotation then you try to predict the correct rotation of the image and this is also a very cheap label that you can generate let's look a bit into context similarity so here the idea is that you want to figure out whether this image is from the same or a different context so you can pick an input patch then you augment it you use different ways of augmentation like changes in color contrast slight movement and general pixel transformations you can also add noise and this gives you essentially for every patch a large number of other patches that should show the same content now you can repeat that with other patches and this allows you to build a large database and with those you can then train whether it's the same patch or not and you can then discriminate with these surrogate classes and train your system. Similar yet different approach is that you use clustering and this is worked by my colleague Vincent Christine. So he was interested in building better features for writer identification. So he started with detecting key points and the key points then allow you to extract patches. At the same time, the key points, if you use things like SIFT, they come up with a feature descriptor. And on the feature descriptor, you can then perform clustering. And the clusters that you get are probably already quite good training samples. So you use the cluster ID in order to train, for example, a ResNet for the prediction of the respective patch. So this way you can use completely unlabeled data, do the clustering, generate pseudo labels and train your system. And Vincent has shown that this actually gives quite a bit of performance in order to improve the representation learning. This idea has then been developed further. You can do it in an alternating manner. So here the idea is deep cluster, you take some input, you have a confnet and you then essentially start from an untrained network, you do a clustering on the generated features and with the clustering, so simply k-means, you can then generate pseudo labels that allow a back propagation and a training of the representation learning. Now of course if you start with random initialization the clustering is probably not very good so you want to alternate between the classification and the clustering and then this allows you to build also very powerful convolutional neural networks. There's also some problems with trivial solutions that you want to avoid so you want to reassign empty clusters and of course you can use tricks like weighting the contribution of an input by inverse of its size of its assigned cluster. You can even build on this idea further and this leads to self-labeling with optimal transport in reference 24 and here they essentially further develop deep cluster and instead of using clustering they're using the syncon knob algorithm in order to determine pseudo labels. The idea here is that you try to predict the optimal transport and here we can see this example for an optimal transport problem let's say you have supply in warehouse A and warehouse B each of them have 25 laptops and you have need in shop 1 and shop 2 of 25 laptops then you can see that you want to of course ship 
those laptops to the respective shops and of course you take the closest one and all of the laptops from warehouse A in this case go to shop 1 and all of the laptops of warehouse B go to shop 2. The nice thing about this algorithm is you can find a, a linear version of this so you can essentially express all of this with linear algebra and then this means that you can also embed it into a neural network. If you compare a deep cluster with the optimal transport, then you may want to keep in mind if you don't have a separate clustering loss, this can lead to degenerate solutions. And also keep in mind that the clustering approach minimizes the same cross-entropy loss that the network also seeks to optimize. Well, there's a couple of more ideas. We know these recipes like multitask learning, and you can also do multitask learning for self-supervised learning. And an example here is using synthetic imagery. So you have some synthetic image where you can generate the depth, the surface normal, or also the contours. And then you can use those as labels in order to train your network and produce a good representation. Additionally, you can also minimize the feature space domain differences between real and synthetic data in a kind of GAN setup. And this leads also to very good representation learning. So next time, we want to talk about ideas how to work with the losses and make them more suited towards the self-supervised learning task. And we will see that, in particular, the contrastive losses are very useful for this. So. Thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video. Bye-bye.